So um, that's right. He uh, uh, he got all of that right. Um, I just was elected chair, and uh, I used to say I was the second woman president of the SMA, but now I, I guess I'm the first woman president of the services board, chairman of the board. Um, so today I want to thank you all for getting up this early. I hope I'm not disappointing anybody by letting them know that there are no samples involved with this lecture. Um, uh, the uh, situation in Florida has changed, but uh, it's uh, not quite to that point. I think today after uh, uh, we have this lecture, you're going to uh, uh, be aware of much, much of the information available on uh, marijuana and uh, should be in good position to share that with your patients. Uh, disclosures, obviously, no financial disclosures. I, I assume that meant pharmaceutical involvement, but uh, I don't have any. <laughs> So what are my objectives today? Uh, I want to increase physician awareness of marijuana pharmacology. Uh, I want to present the history of marijuana use. Uh, I want to present the current FDA approvals, uh, present the current science of the cannabinoids, and uh, I'd like to share the uh, current legal status. Um, uh, the, and this lecture is current uh, from last week. So marijuana, um, I'm sure you know it was derived from the hemp plant. Uh, uh, cannabis is the scientific name. The fastest delivery system uh, is by inhalation. That's why it's uh, popularly smoked uh, uh, in many, many cultures. The Institute of Medicine did a study in 1999. They identified very few scientific studies, but they did identify risk. Uh, a separate AMA study also concluded very few scientific studies, but they did recommend the FDA change from a Schedule I drug in order to further study it. Because it's a Schedule I drug, it can't be studied in the United States, so <clears throat> the reports you read here are all self-reported uh, and um, very hard to reach the scientific evidence stage. However, in the lay literature, it's all around us, right? I mean, every magazine you pick up, every television program you put on um, has a picture of the marijuana plant or uh, someone claiming uh, that they were helped from it. And being the compassionate individuals we are, we want to know is that uh, myth or is that science? Um, it's certainly uh, not a new drug. Historically, it's been used for more than 3,000 years, uh, and it was actually legal in the United States from 1848 till 1937. Uh, in uh, 1937, the federal law passed the uh, 1937 Marijuana Tax Act, and they restricted its use and made possession illegal. Um, there's some anecdotal uh, studies or, or, or uh, remarks at that time that this was also the time that uh, one of our big chemical companies came out with synthetic nylon rope. And so the hemp crop was not as necessary to our military and other uses in society. And uh, there's some thought that perhaps the lobbyists had uh, something to do with the fact that, that this was made uh, so restricted. However, as of uh, December of last year, uh, the Federal Department of Justice has stopped federal prosecutions, which creates kind of an interesting legal situation for people who are involved uh, in this. What's the significance? I mean, is there any point in us even looking at this? The United Nations <coughs> estimates it to be the largest crop in the world. That's pretty amazing to me. You know, when you think like... The largest crop is the largest. The, no. Uh, worldwide. Worldwide, it's the largest crop, and between 120 million and, and 220 million people use it regularly. Uh, the latest data I have from emergency visits, um, because that, that, as Dr. Uh, Clem was pointing out, that is my field, uh, was 455,000 EC visits where marijuana was identified. Um, most of those were uh, multiple drug use, so it was just in combination. But about 129,000 of them were marijuana alone was identified. So what's the current legal status? Uh, currently, 25 states uh, have statutes rec uh, regulating medical use, and four states permit recreational. I should have asked uh, who, who uh, knows the recreational states. Colorado? Colorado, uh, Oregon, Washington, and Alaska. So um, if you're not in those states, it has to be a, a medical use um, or not at all. So where are we in terms of the science? Um, 
currently, because the FDA has not allowed studying uh, this in the United States, uh, it's considered a recommended herbal treatment, whether it's recommended by a physician or by the corner uh, green pharmacy, um, green cross pharmacy. Um, is there any significant evidence of efficacy? Well, um, it's been reported anecdotally that uh, multiple sclerosis patients benefit. It's been reported um, that anti-nausea for chemotherapy uh, induced nausea, it's effective, and a neuropathic pain. And those are the only three uh, areas that uh, we have s significant uh, evidence for efficacy. Um, there's a lower level of efficacy possibly in the AIDS wasting syndrome. Um, people often talk about uh, having the munchies after they've um, used marijuana. And so it was proposed that perhaps our patients who were suffering from this wasting syndrome would benefit. Uh, it's been proposed to have efficacy in epileptics, particularly in the um, complex uh, childhood seizures, rheumatoid arthritis. And then for our ophthalmologists, I'm sure you've had patients ask you about uh, their glaucoma and using it to lower interocular pressure. And then uh, anecdotal, anecdotal effects that you can find in the literature, there was uh, quite, a, quite a bit that referred to reduced frequency and incidence of pediatric seizures. Uh, this was um, maybe, I don't want to say advertised, but brought to light by uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta when he did his ser series on weed. Um, and it went out on uh, national television. And they particularly focused on families that were suffering with uh, children who had severe complex seizure disorders and um, their desperate uh, plea to have whatever could help those children. Um, and then uh, could it be used to improve the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder? So how, how do the cannabinoids work? Well, they act on receptor sites that actually are throughout the body. It's not just uh, centrally active. However, uh, THC is the most centrally active resin. There are other cannabinols that act on the nervous system and on the immune system receptor sites. Uh, the mechanism of action may be related um, to a slightly central uh, sedating effect on the cannabinoid receptors uh, for, because dopamine increases and also serotonin increases. However, when you go to look at the literature, after all, we're underneath it all scientists, right? And what we want to know is, is there any science behind this? Most of the scientific studies that you can find uh, in the global literature, I, I didn't li limit my uh, look at this to just uh, uh, English studies uh, or American studies. Most were observational. Most were done by patients who used the drugs uh, recreationally and uh, were self-reported. And even the literature that which I reviewed from Canada, where it is uh, also legal, it yielded very few double-blind studies. So what are the active substances? Uh, these are chemically related to delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol uh, or THC. And the THC is the psychotropically active substance. However, there are more than 100 active resins in the marijuana plant. Uh, some effects are known, uh, but uh, most of them are unstudied. Um, the resins in the plant are concentrated in the female plants near the flowers. Uh, this is uh, sativa, um, which is one of the most common crops uh, that you can find worldwide. And the three um, most common varieties are India, sativa, and some uh, combination of the two called skunk. Um, it has a little bit different fragrance from what I read. Uh, what are the uh, chemical effects of THC? Well, they create a central nervous system euphoria or a buzz. Um, however, that has also been reported uh, to be uh, associated with anxiety, addiction, and uh, unfortunately, psychoses. Uh, the uh, chemical effects of CBD, cannabidiol, it's not a centrally active uh, resin, uh, and it has been shown to reduce nausea. This is the part of the uh, marijuana plant that may reduce the wasting in um, AIDS patients. So how safe is this drug? Uh, are there any um, concerns, you know, like any uh, substance we take into our bodies, we have to be concerned, you know, what are those uh, risks? Uh, the only death that I could find attributed to THC was one death in Colorado. Colorado? Oh, yeah, Colorado. Colorado. Um, 
And uh, this was a young uh, person who unfortunately had a hallucination and jumped off a building like the old LSD uh, type uh, uh, suicides. Um, however, it's been reported to impair driving for up to eight hours in one study that was published in the Journal of Medical Toxicology, and uh, that was published last fall. So that's at least a little information that you can have uh, for your patients who have questions about it. And then, is it a gateway drug? Um, this was uh, something in, in our household we um, looked at when we were traveling to Holland, where they uh, do permit um, drugs uh, and marijuana particularly. And their uh, information, at least as of 2008, was that there was no higher incidence of other drug use in people who ingested uh, 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 marijuana versus people who didn't. So their, their uh, feeling at that time was that it is not a gateway drug. However, it is easier to access than other harder drugs. And being a pediatric emergency physician, the risk to children is always a concern for me. Um, there is a 10% risk of addiction. And unfortunately, we don't know which uh, uh, person in 10 is going to become addicted. So uh, that uh, is, is a concern in children. And the relative risk of persistent psychosis is also a concern. Um, there are um, plenty of observational uh, reports in the literature that say a uh, patient in, uh, ingested marijuana and then subsequently developed a psychosis. So the, it's, you're not proving cause and effect when you observe that, but it is a concern. There was also recently published a study that uh, observed lowered IQ in patients who were heavy uh, marijuana users for more than 20 years. Um, you know, maybe that's a concern, maybe it isn't. I, I would be concerned. Uh, U.S. Justi Justice Department just released statistics uh, which support that there's been no increased use in teenagers from 1999 to 2014. So it's been a fairly uh, consistent level. Now, what are the other risks of marijuana? Uh, because it is an inhaled uh, substance uh, by and large, there are pulmonary complications and uh, also the CNS risks. The known pulmonary risks, you, know, you can't be married to a pulmonologist and not think about the risk of smoke uh, uh, coming into the body, is that it can exacerbate COPD. It has been associated with bulla formation and it has also been associated with aspergilla infections. Um, Aspergilla, uh, just as a reminder, is a bronchopulmonary eosinophilia. Uh, a fungus ball develops uh, within the tissue, and it can also uh, produce a diffuse uh, infiltrative infection. All of those are rare. Um, however, it is more of a concern in immune-compromised patients, which if we're going to be um, using this in patients who have a commun uh, compromised immune system, you would want to cons uh, consider that. So how is the marijuana produced? Uh, how do patients ingest it? The leaves uh, have a maximum of 8% THC. However, when they make a hash uh, uh, out of the leaves, the maximum uh, percentage of THC is 20%. There's also an alcohol preparation, uh, which obviously is not smoked, uh, but uh, ingested is uh, uh, in between the 20 and 60%, depending on how it was extracted. However, when they start making the oil, uh, extractions, there may be almost a 60% THC, uh, which then is used in an infusion or in an edible. And for anyone who takes care of children, you can easily see that um, those oils and the edibles are where a lot of the toxicity comes in, because it's a much higher level than, than uh, simply smoking uh, um, marijuana. What's the cost? It's a $36 billion crop worldwide. Uh, in the U.S., it costs $3,000 uh, $3, a pound which uh, works out to 280 to $400 an ounce, or 10 to $15 per gram, and that's a normal um, street value. I was kind of surprised how expensive that was. <laughs> I don't think, um, when my dad was going corn, he could ever get anything that approached to $3,000 a pound. Um, so the adverse side effects um, include dependence, uh, there are, is a withdrawal syndrome, there may be seizures, uh, depression and hallucinations. Um, it has been reported to uh, be associated with cardiovascular arteritis, but commonly the patients are going to uh, complain of dizziness, euphoria, altered thinking, um, 
it, they tend to be a little less motivated uh, when they come in the ER. They just don't have any energy, doc. Okay. Um, hunger, abdominal pain, anxiety, and confusion. Those can all be side effects you'll see with uh, marijuana intoxication. Uh, contraindications, clearly I wouldn't want to recommend this to patients who are on cardiac meds or have an underlying psychiatric disease. Um, seizure disorder has been reported as a contraindication even though anecdotally there have been um, some attempts to use it for seizures and uh, in the elderly would particularly be concerned. So what has the FDA approved? The FDA has approved uh, two uh, cannabidiol products. Uh, one is uh, dronabinol uh, or marinol and it's been approved for uh, control of chemotherapy side effect of nausea. The dose is 2.5 to 10 milligrams twice a day. Onset of action is one to two hours. Half-life is 25 to 30 hours. And the cost, depending on the amount of uh, uh, active ingredient, is up to $65 per dose. So it's uh, not an inexpensive product. I was kind of surprised by that. Uh, the uh, other drug that currently has approval is uh, Nabilone. Yeah, I'm having to pick up Wayne. You know, what, normally Wayne would have this in his lecture, wouldn't he? Our, our FDA uh, expert, uh, Sesamet. Uh, it also is approved for the control of chemotherapy-induced side effects. Um, that, do that drug is uh, dosed at one to two milligrams twice a day, also costly. It's $270 a day. So is it all uh, fuzzy science and uh, smoke and mirrors? Uh, I, I think there are some uh, uh, studies we can talk about, but up until June, there weren't very many uh, uh, good scientific studies. However, the legal environment is that federal law is that uh, marijuana is a Schedule I substance and is illegal. The FDA has not approved cannabis use. However, 25 states have passed laws allowing for some medical use, including Florida, and four states allow recreational use. Uh, Florida law was passed last year. It allows an oral prep uh, known as Charlotte's Web. Um, however, it requires two physicians to agree that this is indicated in, in the uh, uh, use in children, and the patient has to be enrolled in a study at uh, the University of Florida. That um, law has uh, been tested in the courts and the judge is still looking at whether the Department of Health regulations on this is too onerous and uh, needs to be reworked but that's the way the current law is in Florida. There was also an attempt in 2014 to uh, add a more liberal um, medical marijuana constitutional amendment to the Florida Constitution but that did not pass uh, through the uh, public of voting time. So what are the guidelines? Uh, American Academy of Pediatrics uh, recommends that because there are known risks of inhaling chemicals into the lungs, the AAP steering committee does not recommend pediatricians support smoking marijuana. Pretty safe statement. Uh, concerns were also voiced about inducing other drug use and unmasking schiz uh, schizophrenia. The American Thoracic Society also has a policy of not supporting smoking marijuana due to concerns of exacerbating COPD and bullet formation. They also had concerns over tar and aspergillus inhal inhalation. Um, I can tell you that Don, Don uh, has had a, probably one of the most interesting patients who rescued a bale of marijuana from the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, unfortunately, it was in the fall, about the time of red tide. And he was careful enough to dry it out so that it was dry enough that he could light it. However, he basically uh, smoked red tide and uh, it was not a good thing for his lungs. Um, they also recommend, uh, recognize that they were unable to determine a minimum dose for toxicity. So uh, I guess that goes in that patients will try anything category. So worldwide, if you want to study marijuana, the world expert is Dr. Raphael Malokin. He is a scientist in Israel who has been studying uh, the cannabinoids for 50 years. He's, uh, he's getting senior, he's, he's over your 59, I'll say that. Um, there are currently 20,000 patients who receive the drug as medically prescribed in Israel. Uh, however, the um, dosing is left uh, somewhat to the patients and they can self-administer um, uh, as uh, indicated. Patients in his care uh, report relief from depression, uh, pain, 
multiple sclerosis, seizures, post-traumatic stress disorder, cognitive dysfunction. Uh, and I know we had a good lecture yesterday from uh, Dr. Holt um, about uh, uh, cognitive impairment and from trauma and Alzheimer's. So uh, at least in Israel, they're more progressive in how they're studying it. And I think as scientists, uh, we have to applaud that. So up until June 30th of 2015, that was the complete uh, summary of the world literature. And uh, I would have said you, uh, as individual practitioners, are as aware of anything uh, that's out there in the marijuana uh, literature. However, in uh, JAMA, on June 30th, they published a uh, study uh, that was um, organized by Dr. Whiting of England. Uh, she received a Swiss grant from the uh, government of Switzerland, so there were no um, pharmaceutical um, biases in this. And working with 12 collaborators, MD, PhDs, they reviewed 197 references looking for significant uh, evidence of um, positive or negative effects of the cannabinoids. And their uh, paper was quite extensive. Uh, she studied uh, cannabinoids for medical use. Uh, there were 79 trials, but even looking at the whole world literature, that, that she was only find, able to find uh, 6,462 participants. So in a drug that's being used by hundreds of millions of people, this is a very understudied drug. And so I think uh, as physicians, I could certainly understand anyone being leery of recommending it at this point. So what were their conclusions? They were able to find moderate quality of evidence to support use for chronic pain and spasticity, uh, low quality evidence to support improvement of chemo-induced nausea and vomiting, uh, low quality evidence to support uh, weight gain use in HIV or the AIDS wasting uh, patients, uh, low quality evidence uh, to be used as a sleep uh, enhancer and for Tourette's. Uh, they also found increased risk of uh, adverse side effects in, in, in their uh, studies. However, the adverse uh, side effects were mostly short term. Uh, they included dry mouth, nausea, fatigue, uh, sleepiness, euphoria, vomiting, disorientation, you know, all the reasons that <laughs> some people smoke it, drowsiness, uh, confusion, loss of balance, which would be a risk for our elderly patients, and hallucinations. Most all of the studies were very short duration, less than six months, and the numbers, as I pointed out, 6,400 were very small. So the conclusion, uh, Dr. Bristol's, uh, or Dr. Whiting's conclusion was that there was definitely evidence for, that further studies need, of longer duration and with greater patients needed to be done, greater numbers. And the pediatric patients in all of those studies were only included in the chemo trials. So very few, uh, very few uh, studies uh, uh, done with children. So um, that's uh, as much information as uh, we could glean from all the world literature on marijuana, but I wanted to leave time for you to ask questions, uh, comments, patients you've had or uh, uh, experiences you've had. I certainly would welcome those. Thank you. Paul, if you could, the, the reference that you gave in there, that I think it's a, a earlier uh, a JAMA paper from earlier this year. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's in, your, in it's, there. It's right that here. is a, an excellent reference. And one of the things, I, I read that paper when it came out. Um, can you speak to the, 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 the variety of marijuana that's out there? Right. Right. I was amazed. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, well, as I said, there's over 100 different active resins in the marijuana. And so currently, um, pharmaceutical companies are starting to separate out uh, different of these resins uh, to look at their chemical activities. And um, I mentioned the three most common uh, varieties, but there are probably, uh, well, any, anytime you have two plants, you know, you can uh, adjust them so that they can have more um, offspring than, than just those single plants. So there's literally hundreds and uh, hundreds of varieties. Um, in England, there is currently a, a plant, a pharmaceutical plant, not a, green plant, a pharmaceutical plant 
that is uh, producing and studying isolated uh, cannabidiols that um, they're looking at individual uh, responses in the body to, but it's so uh, much a concern to the English government that the, the, uh, the plant is hidden and it's uh, not, you know, there's no way for the public to find where this operation is even. Um, so it's not a, a simple thing. Dr. Whiting, I thought, did an amazing job of collecting the world literature and looking at what uh, has been studied and what still could be studied to uh, help our patients. And that's the bottom line. We want to help our patients and not harm them. Although after hearing Dr. King say that only 8% do what we ask them to do, <laughs> I was a little discouraged about that. That depends on what you're asking them to do, I suppose. I guess that's right. <laughs> <clears throat> um, why do you think th that marijuana never got the pharmaceutical attention that other uh, opioids and so forth got? Well, it's illegal to study in this country. I think that's, that's the number one reason. But even, even earlier in the century, um, you know, I mean, you had... You grow your own oxycontin. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Right. I, I think it was uh, available in the rural population and, and, you know, wasn't hard to get into the cities with, uh, with it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there maybe wasn't the market for it. But when you look at the shelves in the green pharmacies uh, that... Uh, uh, Dr. Cotter, Cotter was saying, uh, his, his daughter pointed out to him, um, the price is very similar. It's $200, $400 an ounce, depending on what variety of marijuana they're purchasing. And um, they have big, big grow, uh, grow facilities with the lights uh, in the warehouses growing these, these plants and then harvesting them and drying them. Did you run into any uh, uh, numbers or information about the industry now that's oh, developed? It's huge. The, in, the industry in Colorado, of course, nobody's really talking about just how much money. No. But, um, you know, there's a state tax on every bit of it that's sold, and that's 5%. So, I mean, I, I would estimate that it's going to be a billion dollar industry out there. Oh. So that's, you know, figured out. $50 million for the state. Every state in the country would like to have mm -hmm. some of that. Yeah, um, and that's without federal taxes because you know this. The, uh, that was the other problem uh, for the uh, Colorado business people. The proceeds of the drugs, it's still considered an illegal drug in the United States. So the banks, uh, the banking system in the U.S., are not allowed to deposit money from the sale of drugs. Period. So the People who were harvesting and selling had to have their own infrastructure for handling vast amounts of cash. And um, armored cars, safes, armored personnel is mm -hmm. really how they're moving the money around. And it's all cash. Yeah, it's still. That's what they've been doing with the sale of marijuana prior to this. Right. right. Before, before yeah. the legislature in uh, Colorado make these rules. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. Tom Milam. Uh, one of the concerns I have with a, with a daughter living in Colorado is when it first became uh, uh, legalized, the emergency departments were overrun with overdoses. Intoxication. And, yeah. And uh, um, my daughter works at, for a division of uh, HCA, Health One, a competitor of Kaiser out there. And uh, there was a an, a very high level of concern from the medical community, and uh, uh, that seems to have settled down. Have you seen any anything that you in the we literature? We have anybody about here that? from Colorado? No, or Washington? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, now that's that's a whole different yeah. creature, as you know. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah. The, the um, criminal scientists are so fast at developing synthetic marijuana, bath salts, uh, all of these psychotropic a uh, agents that have um, many more side effects than uh, even the ones we've identified with marijuana. Uh, and those patients, especially the teenagers, end up in the emergency department quite often. Yeah. Can you tell, just give us a little, little insight into the 
bath salts and the, the well what what happens is they um, they change the chemical formulation just enough uh, Dr. Carter, that it escapes the current law and so it can be sold in I don't want to name a, a convenience store, but convenience stores or gas stations, and, and teenagers can pick up a packet for five or ten dollars, and then they go home and they smoke it. They use a little crack pipe, um, and they get high on this or have other effects. The people who produce this stuff know very well what the legislation has been, and they've changed the chemical formulation just enough that they stay ahead of it. Uh, we recently had a very unfortunate case of an infant who got a hold of someone's crack pipe in the household and um, aspirated the mesh. There's a little tiny piece of um, stainless steel or brass mesh that they use at the bottom of it and caused uh, erosion in the trachea. It was a, a huge problem and the patient came in coughing and nobody knew what was wrong. We got a lateral x-ray and could see quite clearly the mesh was caught in there. Interesting. Yes, sir. I can tell you when you mix marijuana with red tide toxins, <laughs> I've looked at 7001. I have never seen an airway like this guy had. First of all, he was a weightlifter. Second of all, his test was the size of teeth because he took two shots of horse testosterone. I mean, wait, this guy was a real trip. And he found this bale floating in a red tide, so he had his buddy hauled it in and dried it out. Did they wash it? In? No, no, they just. Got it really dry, and this guy won't lift this stuff up. I get an emergency call from the ER, yeah. and I mean, this guy had lorenzo spasm like you can't believe. So we gave him a little valium to reduce the lorenzo spasm, which, by the way, it does work. And um, I gave him some xylitine and a shrinker, looked in the airway, and put it on down. He had a red, weeping airway all the way down to the smallest I could get. And it, I've looked at burns, I've looked at chlorine, I've looked at all the terrible stuff you can inhale. Almost none of it ever gets down past the trachea. Mm -hmm. When this guy smart, uh, smoked this thing, it was down in the whole airway. So we had about a week's worth of bronchus fast and stuff that, that, uh, that really was a nightmare. Yeah. This guy, uh, the red toxin actually is a neurotoxin. And by the way, if you have people who are asthmatics who live near the coast, here. My uh, very bright allergist, Dr. Kremlowitz, asked me, well, what's this about? I said, well, it's a neurotoxin. He uses amantadine hydrochloride, an old Parkinson's drug. And mm -hmm. He said amantadine in low doses will block the effects of the neurotoxin for red tide. You won't read anything about it. Uh, I haven't looked it up on my computer yet, but when I tried it uh, on some of my people who lived out on the coast there, it was effective in getting rid of the side effects. But I guess the word, you know, when you haul in a 40 pound codfish, you have to wash it before you Right, 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 Sometimes the alternative drug that I might rightly give them, I know has horrible side effects. Right. And I know has increased dementia. And right. Increased but it, and it, and it, it comes down to using your expertise and your understanding versus uh, the alternative. So it's always a risk and benefit uh, situation. But I'm one long way from not being able to lean on the crutch of, you know, that's illegal, so I really can't recommend it. Right, 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 right. Paul, well, how, how does it work in Florida? Uh, I mean, do the pharmacies keep it stocked, or um, right. I mean, what's the mechanism of this? Right. Uh, there are only certain pharmacies that stock it, mm -hmm. um, but uh, right now it's still in the courts, so it's not been dispensed. I see. And that's okay. the frustration. Um, we've all had patients who, you know, their parents would do anything for them, uh, anything to um, stop their... Uh, seizures or their complications and unfortunately um, the two cases that Dr. Gupte reported on uh, one um, showed initially uh, improvement but both cases eventually had uh, other complications. Dr. Lindstrom. How did the surrounding states police this stuff? 
Well, they're having a huge problem with it. They're not very happy with Colorado because uh, people think they can buy it and then bring it back to their home state. Um, if you have a traffic offense, uh, you know, you're going to have consequences. So I, I'm sure it's the same kind of thing. They have to have a reason to stop the car. Yes, doctor. It's quite a long time. It depends on the concentration of the THC, but it can be detected for quite a long time. Doesn't it also depend on the chronicity of use? Uh, well, whether you, whether you metabolize it. Uh, well, it's, it's deposited in the fatty tissue, so it, not, not as much as some of the other drugs. But it's quite a long time. I, I would say over two weeks. One yes. thing you want to tell your patients, stay away from anything oral. The, the cannabidiol oil that is sold uh, is a fairly known concentration product that has been dosable. The, the stuff in Colorado comes in brownies and cookies and all the other stuff, and when people start getting high, when you smoke, you stop because that's where you want to be. This stuff just keeps on going. Well, that's, that is the problem. You know, he's exactly right. Because when, when you smoke, the onset of action is so much faster than when you ingest it. So when you ingest it, you know, you can go 20 or 30 minutes, you don't feel much effect. And so you have another brownie or piece of pie or whatever. And that is what uh, has been associated with increased uh, it's very much toxicity. Like the person sitting in the bar having three drinks and alcohol slows down the empty, so they stand up and go to the john and three, three martinis hit your small bowel. So yeah. you're passing out. What right. to me. And right. This is what they're seeing with the marijuana people when it gets beyond the stomach. There's this huge blast. And, and per particularly for children, I'm concerned about the time. Yes. Oh, yes. Red flag. To self-medicate. Yes. yes, sir. You're absolutely right. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes what happens is it ends up unmasking a more serious problem. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Very good point. Yes, doctor. I have a question for Dr. Potter. When you were visiting your daughter in Colorado, <laughs> did you take one of the limousine marijuana tours of uh, Disney? Uh, no, but thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, it's very the, easy to find them, Steve. The, the yeah. thing is, they're like, they're almost as common. I mean, I don't know how many of you have been out there. Starbucks. Out there. She lives in the Denver area. Yeah, they're like Starbucks or CVS or yeah. Yeah. they're everywhere. And if you so you know, they, there's a big, wide kind of green cross. Yeah. And I had been a couple of years ago to see her and... Nothing. There wasn't much, you know, and I didn't even really notice. I mean, I'm thinking, I think she was glad that we didn't, but, you know, the, <laughs> as you, well, there's a lot of, a lot, you know, she was raised in Alabama and being in Colorado, you know, things are a little different out there. It's a little looser out there. And, um, but, uh, you know, this time riding around, and I, I almost did it inadvertently because, you know, you're, you run around, you see these, and it's like, oh, what are those? You know, and uh, oh, Dad, those are the uh, marijuana stores, right, and right. you know. And I, I saw a very interesting interview, and I'll share this, and then I'll, I'll get off the podium. But uh, a woman had left her job in the financial market to open a Green Cross store, and she has two children. She's a single mother, and the interviewer asked her, "How do you explain to your children the difference between what you do and what a drug dealer on the corner does?" Oh, she says it's completely different. <laughs> and he says, well, well, tell me how it's different. She says, well, oh, we ask for identification. 
I go, okay, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so you know who you're selling it to. Yeah. All right, well, thank you for being uh, so well, attentive and for coming this morning. Thank you very okay. much.